Right, so um, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, so um, I've had an allotment for I think 15 or 16 years um, and I started growing veg because I wanted to um, eat uh, organic vegetables and they were always a bit expensive and a bit kind of old looking or come from Kenya in the shop. So I wanted to have the, the food really was what I was aiming for and I kind of fell in love with gardening by accident. I didn't really realise I was going to love it so much, but I think just getting outside and being in contact with the soil is such a good therapy. Um, and I got really into it. Um, and I think for the first sort of five or six years, my aim was to be self-sufficient. Um, and so to have food all winter and things. Um, and then I realised about sort of seven years in that I kind of wanted a life as well, because it does take a lot of your time up and I was working full time. So I sort of chilled out a little bit um, and I've cut out things that I don't really eat that much. Um, and, you know, I'm not self-sufficient so much anymore. You know, we used to have chickens and things. Um, but I think it's always nice to have tried it and know how much work it is and then sort of um, fall back a little bit. Um, but yeah, basically I'm doing these talks because um, we're part of an environmental group um, to help with climate change. And um, growing your food is possibly the best thing that you can do for your carbon footprint. Um, so it's, it's between 44 and 57 percent, apparently, of the greenhouse, global greenhouse gas emissions are from um, industrial food production. So if you can um, shop locally and preferably even grow your own stuff, then you're doing a massive service to your carbon footprint. Um, and I also try and teach no dig method as well, because that helps to lock carbon in the soil um, and it's really good for the microbes and the soil life and everything. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, so just to do a bit of a recap, we've got um, uh, two kind of beginners and a beginner, all with allotments. And I'm not sure what... Um, everybody else has got. I think Vanessa and Andreas have a garden at the moment, but are going to have an allotment um, in the future. So Claire, if you, and Emily, because and um, Brian and Rebecca, if you could um, raise your hand if you've got an allotment, you've got a reactions thing at the bottom here, because I know you haven't got your, or you can unmute if you want to talk. Yeah, so one in the allotment, if you, if, do you want to raise your hand if you've got a garden? Yeah, good, lovely. Please feel free to talk at any point. Um, the last talk that I did was all about the vegetables um, and we sort of quite seriously went through the whole time talking about the vegetables and how they grow and things like that. And I'd like this session to be a lot more about um, troubleshooting what you're actually doing now um, because it can be totally flexible. Um, the idea is just to be able to help with any problems that you're having um or anything like that so um please feel free at any point to ask questions um and things like that so i mean i think i'll crack on and start um with that question is there anything that you've got on your mind that you want to ask first of all before i start we, we've got a specific problem with french beans we just don't seem to be able to grow them at all yeah, um, they're going quite green, and now they've gone very anemic. Looking, right. <laughs> um, over the so, last probably two or three weeks, and we just can And the same happened last year. They just we we bring them on in the small greenhouse and then put them out, and they they just kind of wilt away rather than um, actually develop into any green beans. I think you've probably got the same thing as I've been doing for years and putting them out too early. All right. Um, so um, French runner beans aren't quite as delicate. They're a little bit more um, OK with British weather. French beans are really quite tender. Um, and I always think of the beginning of May as a time when you should be able to put beans out. Um, and they always struggle for the first three weeks and then they eventually get going. Um, and this year I tried a sort of different trick. Um, in the, if you get dwarf um, beans, they tend to crop sooner than climbing ones. So I've always done climbing ones before because I figure they're better use of space for the yield. 
So did you have climbing ones or dwarf? Dwarf, dwarf ones. Dwarf. Ah, right, okay. And then, um, well, my idea was of just doing dwarf ones is when I plant climbing ones, they're underneath a beam frame that's already erected and I can't protect them at all. Whereas with dwarf beams, you can put a bit of horticultural fleece over the top. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yeah, a fair point, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think probably I, I did so, I sowed my French dwarf beams around mid April, planted them out first week, second week of May, mm -hmm. and then covered in fleece, and they were covered in fleece all of May. And I've just uncovered it in the last few days. And I think that helps them to harden off as well. When they go from polytunnel or greenhouse and then straight out into the cold, mm. having a bit of fleece over the top is really quite good to harden them off. Oh, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah, and I sowed my climbing French beans at the same time as I planted out the dwarf ones. And then my climbing ones are about uh, six inches now. Um, and so I was I was going to plant them out last weekend. I didn't get around to it. So the next weekend they'll go out. And it feels now that it's like a bit warmer, isn't it? It's sort of getting yeah. May was so cold um, and April, really. Was, I think everything's behind this year. So we think everything's about a month behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And um, last year I had fantastic spinach and cabbages and this year they're pathetic. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very strange. Um, so is there anything else anybody can think of? Um, Brian, you said that you were really at the beginning stage of starting your allotment. Yeah, yeah, we just, uh, sorry, I was just finding the uh, mute. So <clears throat> we okay. we are literally right at, the, right at the beginning, having it, you know, maybe six weeks now in, in managed to to dig out a whole bunch of weeds. So what can we actually plant right now um, that, would, that would grow, <laughs> technically? Have you got any um, anything growing as seedlings at all? So, yeah, we, we've just put some parsnips in and some cauliflower, um, some onions, uh, which the dog happily dug up again, um, so oh. they're, they're gone. Um, we, we've got some existing raspberries, um, grapes, apple tree. Wow. Yeah. and we've got some purple sprout and broccoli so but i have no idea what to do with those so the purple sprouting broccoli will probably be starting to go to seed now they're, they're, they're seedling, sorry um they're, they're oh, just they're, they're tiny like maybe two maybe. inches tall we planted yeah. them in seed trays about two weeks ago three weeks ago lovely well when they get their um second leaves then um i'd plant them in a seed bed so if you've cleared a patch of ground, it's also really helpful if you haven't cleared everywhere yet to do a seed bed. So um, if you if you get a piece of horticulture, uh, basically brassicas need to be protected from everything, like everything eats them. <laughs> so horticultural fleece I've found protects things from flea beetle, cabbage and white butterflies, pigeons, um, aphid, you know, white fly. Um, and... Um, so if you it comes on a two two meter wide roll from garden centers so if you buy a piece that's two meters long two meters wide if you um have a patch that is um i would say about five foot by five foot you can put that bit of fleece over the top of that in a square and you'll um, have a perfect place to grow about six cabbages um but if you um start off with um that's okay, Andres. If you start off with um, a seed bed, you can put things much closer together, about 10 centimetres apart. So your seedlings that you've got, once they get like a couple of true leaves, which is the leaf and the finishing shape rather than the little heart-shaped leaf you get on a brassica. Um, and then um, do rows in your seed bed, plant them 10 centimetres apart, and then wait until they get to a decent size. And that will, there'll, there'll probably be a few that get eaten by slugs or you lose for some reason or another. And then you can pick out the healthiest ones. And then probably by that time, you've cleared another part of your allotment and you can plant say six of those to one of the little pods. Um, so I hope that helps. That's what I do with all my brassicas and it really works. Apart from this year is a weird, weird year, I think for things. No, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Cool. There's also I, I haven't actually got it down to talk about it much in the um, in the um, talk is the no dig method, 
but it is actually at the beginning of the slideshow. So is there any other questions anyone can think of while we're here? I was just going to ask um, whether there was any a, a good book or a good reading material that you could read because there's so yeah. many there's so much on the internet and there's so many things that you just get lost yeah I know what you mean and I, I I'm sort of sort of person where I don't like a book to give me half the information mm -hmm. I find that really irritating where you still you read it and you're still left with questions so give me two seconds I'll get it off the shelf Uh, this is the first book that I read, Grow, Grow Your Own Vegetables by jo Joy Larkham. Um, and it's a bit of a kind of really dull looking book, um, but it's got every vegetable separately in there. So you can look up that vegetable and it will tell you the planting distance, the time of year, the pests, everything that you need to know about that vegetable. Um, and um, it's um, really, really comprehensive re re uh, reference book. Um, but like the talks that I'm doing have also got notes online on ttw.org.uk. So you can look at the notes that I've done for the time of year and that might help as well. Um, I've basically, some of what I've done is actually just abbreviated Joy Larkin. <laughs> um, so rather than being such a lot of text, it's kind of a little bit more condensed. Um, and um, you were asking about what other things that we can sow and plant now. I think we'll probably cover that in the talk as well. So, yeah, I'll get on then. <laughs> Is that OK? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Right. So where are we then? Where's me? There we go. So, OK. So can everyone see that? Um, so I've got uh, basically it's sort of in two sections, really. I'd, I'd say what this you can see. Can you see my cursor there? Yeah, um, that one I would say is the sort of theory. And then this is all about vegetables. Um, I do quite like the theory, if I'm honest. <laughs> so um, I'll, it, is there any I think if we start with a theory, it will actually really help um, Brian and Rebecca starting with mulching. Um, so I just started with that's a picture of my allotment yesterday um, to give you an idea of the layout and things. So I've got um, five foot wide beds um, and with the no dig method, the idea is that you don't stand on the soil. So having the five foot wide beds means that you can kneel on the path and lean in and reach the middle. If they're any wider, in fact, four foot wide would probably be better. They're any wider than five foot, you'll be tempted to stand on the bed. So although five foot is very good for having two rows of potatoes, it's just wide enough. Um, so this is the south facing side. I've got a hedge, unfortunately, on the north facing side, which kind of sh shades out this bit. Um, but this bit of plastic here is my manure heap this year. And these little guys here are the pods that I was talking about for brassicas. And um, we have a little pod which has a few in. Okay. So I'll start off with mulches. So mulches are um, a way of keeping weeds down, um, helping to reduce surface runoff of water. Um, you can um, use them for all manner of purposes, really. Um, and a clearance mulch is where you cover it up so nothing grows, and it's really helpful during the winter. Um, and this year I took a few photos as I uncovered my beds. So this is just one bed. Um, somebody on a comments bit of Facebook once said that, oh yeah, you don't want to use plastic on the ground because it suffocates the ground. No idea where they got that from. I've never heard of that. And I really don't think it's suffocating the ground because look, I had two toads underneath. <laughs> um, they were quite, they love it under the plastic. Um, I just filmed this worm actually um, crawling out of a hole um, and there's always loads of those um, and those little um, centipedes and things. So you just uncover it and it's just crawling with life. Um, and um, if you can see the top right hand corner, I actually left the sweet corn stems in and folded them over, left the roots in um, and um, just let them biodegrade. Um, and so when I came to actually planting things, all you need to do is take the plastic off. You can see on the bottom right hand corner how clear that is. 
So where it hasn't been covered, this would have been, um, I think it was mid-April or early May. You've got all this greenery around. Everything that isn't covered is growing lushly. Um, and you've got no weeds at all on, on the patch that's covered. So as a beginner, or actually for anyone, if you, if you work <laughs> um, and you don't, have, don't want to spend all of your life in the spring weeding, um, covering up with um, black plastic is really helpful because it cuts out all the light. You can seal in moisture from the autumn um, and then it doesn't evaporate. And sometimes if it's a dry spring, you can actually pull it back and it's still damp underneath and everybody else is worrying about drought and can't sow their seeds. So it helps to keep a bit of moisture in the soil. Um, and the plastic that I've used, I've had the same stuff for, I didn't use it at the beginning. Um, I think it was probably 13 years I've had that plastic, that particular piece of plastic. And you just roll it up and put it in the shed and I reckon it's got another 20 years in it. So um, from a sort of waste point of view, I don't think it's really that, that bad. And everything gets burnt at Avon Mount for electricity anyway, if you live here. Um, so yeah, that is a clear and smulch. And the idea is that you, if you want to stop annual weeds growing in the spring, you cover it up in September all the way through the winter. If you want to clear an area of persistent weeds, you do have to have it on all of summer as well. So if you get in a new allotment and it's a bit dauntingly big um, and you're not sure what quite to do with it and it's, um, you know, worrying you, it's a nice idea so almost as soon as you get there just to cover it all in black plastic because if there's an area you don't get to this year, by next year it will be clear of weeds. Um, so it is a handy, easy tool for um, busy people. Um, I'll come on to green manures later, but if you look, this is actually for Celia, all this brown stuff. Um, and um, I've just filled it, filled my wheelbarrow up with it on and put it in the compost as browns. Okay, any questions on that bit? No? Oh, if you raise your hand or just unmute yourself, then you can just go ahead and ask. Um, oh. Let's see if we do the next page. How do I do that? Oh, look, here we go. Um, so a grow through mulch, I think, um, Brian, with your new allotment, this might be really useful. So um, a grow through mulch is something that you can put on in the summer and still grow plants through it. So this is uh, representing cardboard. Um, and you can see my cursor. And the cardboard has to overlap by 20 centimetres, which is quite a lot. Um, underneath here, these little guys are re representing squashed weeds. So as long as you haven't got things that are going to seed, um, just because it would um, be a bit of a seed bed, you can just rip off the seed heads if you want before you put it on. You can just leave them on if you want, but when the stuff biodegrades, you might have a few more weeds in the, um, in the soil, but it's not really necessary even to take the seed heads off. You can just cover up all the weeds in cardboard. And then this layer on top here is um, compost or manure um, or some other sort of um, mulch. Like in this bed here, we've used fresh bark chip um, because we're trying to suppress a load of couch grass and let some fruit um, canes grow. Um, so yeah, if you can try that. I wouldn't recommend using fresh wood chip if you're growing vegetables. Um, you're better off really with compost um, or manure and maybe municipal compost is a good idea. Um, but you can use um, grass and leaves and things like that as well. Um, any living material basically that you might put in your compost bin. Um, and then you plant a do a little hole in the cardboard and you plant through that. And this has actually got a bit of compost on the top to plant through so that it gives it a bit more of a chance. Ooh. Um, right, so has anybody tried grow through mulch um, with any success? Nobody tried it? It's only ever any good if you've got plants. It's no good for sowing seed in. Um, when we first did our allotment, actually, the only bit we did with a grow through mulch was the herb bed. Um, it was really handy for that, actually. Um, OK. Um, and a maintenance mulch is something that you put on the surface to help keep the water in. 
And I've had, I'm basically, I've not done a lot of mm. maintenance mulches before. The only things I've really used is manure and compost, um, mainly for time. And last year, I really focused on trying to sort my compost making skills out. And this year, I'm talk, trying to talk, sort out my summer mulching is my mission. And I must say, mixed bag with how I found it. Um, so this was um, lettuce and I put some leaves that I collected in the autumn around the lettuce and that was in April, the picture on the left, and I must say it worked really well, um, really pleased with the dry leaves. Um, I felt like I gave it a really good water, like four or five or six watering cans full on the patch after a period of drought then put the leaves on top because and it, I'm sure it helped to seal in the water um, nothing got eaten by slugs um, you can see them all growing well in the right hand picture um, yeah happy with leaves so I recommend that now this was something that didn't work <laughs> I like to share my experiences with you even if they're good or bad I tried sheep's wool I got given a fleece by somebody last year never got around to doing it last year um, left hand picture, I put the sheep's wool around my brassicas. I thought brassicas are a good idea to start with because um, the problem with summer mulch is it can encourage slugs. Um, and I thought, well, my brassica pods, the birds can't get in them, so there's no hope for me anyway with slugs. Um, but I was really disappointed because if you see this middle picture, it didn't suppress the weeds at all. That was totally unlooked at for a month. Um, I did let this common ground cell um, self-seed last year for the cinnabar moth. And I know that there was quite a patch of it there. So there was quite a lot of weed seeds, but it's just not suppressed them at all, has it? Um, and then when I actually tried taking the weeds out, it, all the wool just came with it and it was all a muddy mess and I just put it in my compost bin. So I would say, don't bother with wool. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, you can get wool pellets for slugs. Now they I hear are fantastic. I've still got some slug off, which is a um, recycled cardboard alternative. Has anybody used slug off or wool pellets? No. Slug off is, um, it looks like cat litter and the slugs don't like crawling over it. That I found really works, but you only get a box like this big for like five or seven quid. So you wouldn't be able to use it as a mulch on a large scale, but you can put it around individual plants. Um, and I do it quite a lot in my garden because I've got more slugs in my garden actually. So yeah, that was a didn't work job. Um, and so then I tried straw. So I've done straw on the strawberries. That is actually a type of mulch, isn't it? Because you're covering up the soil. Um, it's really needed with strawberries. I wouldn't not use it because um, unless you're in pots, the strawberries will sit on the soil and then you get muddy strawberries which you can't clean so definitely put straw around your strawberries um so i tried it around my brassicas and it's really weird because that's the left hand one is when i put it on i put my six um cauliflowers in middle one is a couple of weeks later then four out of six of the plants have got eaten by slugs so that's like that well that didn't work but right hand picture okay you've got a bit of slug damage but they're still okay so I've left it on the right hand side to see whether it works. Those cabbages are pretty vigorous cabbages. So it might just be that they're growing quicker than the slugs can manage to eat them. Um, but compost, you see, this is what I normally do. <laughs> um, and so I would say, if you're gonna use a maintenance mulch, go with something that's already rotted because there's nothing for the slugs to eat. And I actually think that they were being attracted by extra food on the surface. Um, and then going, oh, look, cabbage, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, that's been my experience so far this year. I'm going to try a bit more experimentation. Um, but, um, but yeah. So um, has anyone else tried any summer mulches? No? I know a lot of people use grass clippings. Um, but I tend to put it in my compost. Um, and I think when I was using the mulches, I was thinking, oh, I could be composting this and I think that's what essentially I'm going to do from now on is I'm just going to anything fresh I'm going to put it in the compost you could actually feasibly make compost in six months and I think it's a lot better to actually put compost on the surface 
Um, it will do the same job. The reason why you put mulch on there is to protect the surface of the soil from the elements and stop so many annual weeds growing and it'll still do that. And you can hoe more easily. Um, so you can hoe the little weeds off when they come. So yeah, it's my this year's experiment. <laughs> Any um, questions or thoughts or anyone sharing any other experiences they've had? No? Anyway, so. Oh, Lisa, you've raised a hand. What have you, what have you got question? I have, only because um, I will, I, I'm new to all of this and I, I was wondering, is there a difference? I've just finished scything my lawn um, and I was wondering, what's the difference between mulching with longer scythed grass and can, if you do lawn mow, is, is that good for mulching, the, the grass cuttings, or is it only scythings, or what? Is there a... Um, I think Andy said that scythings, because they're bigger pieces, they don't heat up as much. So when you're mulching around a tree like we, sh like we do um, in the group, we um, cut the grass with a scythe and then we'll lay it down around a tree to provide a sort of metre square area. That, and we actually pile it quite thick, um, talking about a foot thick, um, and that will actually suppress the grass that's growing around the tree. Um, and I don't know if you know, but small trees really hate competition from grass, and especially in their early life, um, because it uses the same nutrients as the tree wants. So if you can suppress the grass, that's really great. And because you're putting it up quite close to a young tree, the benefit of scythed grass is it doesn't heat up so much. Um, but with grass cuttings, if you've ever left a wheelbarrow full of grass cuttings for more than a day, you'll know how hot it gets really quite quickly. Um, when I cut my grass with a lawnmower, which I do on all of the grassy paths in the allotment, um, we use that in our compost bins, in the Dalek compost bins, um, you know, the black plastic things, um, and we'll layer it with shredded office paper and it heats up really quickly and it makes really good compost. So I'd, I'd probably save my grass clippings for compost being a bit more. And because it's fresh, you might be encouraging the slugs as well. <sighs> Lovely. Any other questions? Are you quite happy with the three different types of mulching? Like um, the clearance mulch is a definite winner. Um, maintenance mulch, I'd, uh, sorry, the grow through mulch is more of a thing if you're starting off and you've got loads of weeds to cover because I haven't used the clearance mulch really that much because I cover it in black plastic and then I don't need a mulch because there's not a load of weeds to cover so um, I don't need to put one to grow through um, so that's why I haven't really used that since much since I've started so yeah no digging isn't you know it's just the absence of digging for the sake of it it's not really anything too complicated to get your head around it's just you don't have to turn the earth over in the um, autumn and stuff okay you can still dig weeds out if you want to um, there's no harm in that um, okay so um making compost um so this I actually covered in the last um, talk that I did. So save repeating myself. Has anybody managed to make any compost this year or started? Got a bit of shrugging. <laughs> have you made compost, have you, Anita? I love my compost and I've got a bucket full of comfrey leaves which are which are full of delicious worms that are sort of swimming around oh. on the top. Cool! <laughs> so you're steeping that in water to make the comfrey liquid. Lovely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've, um, I was really pleased actually last year I went from my I've got my Dalek compost bins um, and I would say that I probably emptied them every two or three years and I had them on rotation and every year I'd have a full bin of compost 
which was kind of all right. Um, but during lockdown last year, I was like, well, this isn't good enough. I want to have more compost um, <laughs> and I want to have it quicker. And I don't want to have to buy in municipal compost and give them all my green waste and then buy it back off them. So um, I was a lot better at making compost. And I think now I've got into it. I am working again now. It does take a bit of time, um, but I think it's not it's not like um, rocket science, but it is a bit of a it is a bit of a labor of love in a way, because basically when you're weeding, if you can put anything that is a not what I'd call a noxious weed. So bindweed, buttercup roots, dock roots, um, stinging nettle roots, things or anything that's going to seed. You don't really want them in your compost. So if you can put them to one side, either soak them in water for two weeks so that they rot and then you can put it in your compost bin or take it to the tip. Um, but anything that is um, leafy green is your greens and everything that's dried is your browns. So grass clippings, if they're green, then they're greens, they've got loads of nitrogen in. If they've dried and they've lasted the whole summer and they've gone that nice beige cover and they're proper straw, then they're browns. And it's the same with leaves. Like green leaves have loads of nitrogen in. When they dry up, they've got loads of carbon in. Um, so um, it's actually easier to save browns than you think. I always thought it was all about uh, newspaper and office paper, but actually um, you can just use your, leave your leaves to dry up a bit and then they're browns. Um, so um, you're supposed to, you can layer your compost thinly but I actually quite like to just mix mine now and cutting it up small is the secret of fast compost so just cut it up as small as you can even if you put it in a wheelbarrow and get a pair of shears and cut it up um, then that just helps it all degrade better um, and you can actually add um, fairly fresh manure in as well for actually the fresher the better um, because that will actually activate the compost so I learned that from the guy who um, started the uh, um, Soil Association. Um, but yeah, um, Helen, we have a we have a question in the chat from Emily, who says we don't have enough room for a compost bin. Any ideas of what we can do? As we have two raised beds, we have made that we have planted up with veg. Lovely. So um, in regards to compost, I take it, what you can do about compost. Yeah. Um, there, there are some, I think there's something called a Bokashi compost system, which is something that you can keep in your kitchen worktop and it's really tiny. Um, and um, you do have to have an initial outlay, but it's pretty good for small amounts of compost. And apparently it's quite fast. I've not tried it myself. I think it's B-O-K. A-S-H-I or something like that. Can you look it up, Anita? Is that right? You, you're able to. Um, and then there's um, worm compost is a lot smaller as well. Um, I, Andreas actually did um, has got worm compost in his back garden and it's um, quite small, isn't it? A bit more compact. Um, and um, yeah, so there's something to, if you just Google both of those things, um, then it should give you some more information, but it's space that you're, talking about isn't it really for actually having a compost bin is that right <laughs> i can't see my chat actually at the moment Ooh. is that is that okay for an answer because i mean it does take up a bit of space having a one of those black Daleks. I, I did actually have one in my back garden and then I removed it because I wanted the space for planting things. Um, you can, if you've got a sort of hidden bit behind a shed or somewhere out of the way, you can pile green waste up. It just won't degrade very quickly at all, but it can be a bit of a habitat for something, you know. Um, so uh, your sort of seed heads and things like that. Okay, right, let's crack on because I do tend to go on a bit. Um, so that's uh, stirring compost. So turning compost really helps it to um, speed up as well. Um, so we just put it in compost bins. You can see it's not very degraded on the left, 
Um, you can still see the paper in it. That's the first turn. I would fill up my compost bin. I always have one that is the main one um, that I'm filling and then I have it in stages now. So they're in a bit of rotation of what I fill up. So fill up one compost bin until you can't get any more in it um, or you've got another one free and then wait six weeks and it should heat up. And then after about six weeks, the heat starts to go. And as it starts to go, then turn it. Um, you can turn it more often than that, but I quite like to um, have the benefit of the heat um, to start with. Okay. Now, this is what Anita was saying about putting comfrey leaves in a bucket of water. Um, on the left here, we've got proper comfrey juice. It's nice and black. Um, so this is my comfrey maker. This is um, an idea, really, if you've got a bit more space, because it takes a bit of space to grow comfrey. Um, but it is worth it. If you don't have the space, you can do the same exact thing with stinging nettles. So um, you can go into a hedgerow somewhere and use stinging nettles for this. They've both got loads of potassium in. Um, and the idea is you have a, bucket, a thing with a tap. In fact, I'll show you on the next one. So I opened it up. This is today's pictures, this is. Um, so opened it up, full of spiders. <laughs> this, is, this thing is like 16 years old, this bucket. So I've got something heavy on there. The thing with the handle on the left-hand side here, that is a bucket with stones in it and a lot of spiders. This is what I put in there a few weeks ago. It's all broke, you know, started to rot. Ooh. Um, I filled it up again, put a load of greens in there, put the stones on top and then um, put the dustbin on so I can't see it. Um, it's a helpful lid because then I can balance that thing on the top and fill it right up. Um, and then when I want some of the black liquid, I just use a little tap and it's really great. You make, do it 20 to one with water for fertilizing your tomatoes and anything that flowers actually. Um, so, um, talking about growing comfrey, has any, I just copied these notes from the notes that are online because again, it's something that I'm trying to get better at this year and I wanted to have them in front of me so I didn't forget things. Um, but does anyone actually have space to do green manures? Because there's not much to me point me talking about it if you haven't actually got enough space to dedicate to a green manure patch. Um, we, we've got plenty of space, but we're, we're far too uh, novice-like to even consider it this year. Um, but we'd, we'd love to learn about it, but perhaps not, not at this time. Okay. Well, I think the um, main thing for a beginner is like, if anybody offers you Bocking 14, I'll wave my curse around it. If anybody offers you Bocking 14 comfrey, say yes, um, because they grow really well from root cuttings. If somebody's having a clear out of their allotment, they might be digging some up. Um, and um, it's just bung them in a corner somewhere, um, and that basically will be a nice little um, perennial um, green manure patch. Um, but when it comes to when you have a patch of space empty after something's been harvested, if you haven't got something to put in it, um, then you can put a green manure in. And I've always just really simply stuck to Phacelia um, for all of the years before this. Um, and this year I'm gonna try and do something a bit more exciting. So I can let you know how it goes in September maybe, October, um, even January next year. All right. Helen, can I ask a question about yeah. comfrey? Because um, I've got loads of it in my garden. Um, is it good to keep adding leaves and flowers and stuff to the um, bucket where it's all sort of decomposing or, or or do I, I don't know quite how to maintain it. Should I just keep cutting and putting it in or? So I would say that you're gonna to wanna to use the stuff that you've got and have it on rotation. So if you've got um, a bucket um, that you did one time, I would then leave that for two weeks okay. and then start a fresh bucket next time you cut it and then use the liquid that you have off the first bucket, throw the stuff, the, the gooey stuff in your compost bin and then start another bucket. Right. Um, you can also use comfrey leaves as a, um, a summer mulch. 
Um, again, I don't know how badly it um, attracts slugs, but actually the only time I have used it was years ago and I found that it dried up really quickly. So the fact that it dries up, maybe it won't be so bad for slugs. Um, the Bocking 14 has got sterile seeds. So I wonder, Anita, whether you've got the one that um, spreads by seed, the wild type. I don't know. It's huge. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Absolutely love it. Um, but oh. it's like it's taller than I am now. OK. And um, has it, does it spread around your garden? Have you got any other places cropping up or is it quite well contained? It's fairly well contained. Uh, no, it's it, it's quite vigorous. I mean, I do have to take it out to stop it spreading. OK, because yeah. if you um, if you have the wild type, it is quite um, it's not exactly invasive, but it's pretty vigorous and it will self seed. Yeah. Whereas the reason why Bocking 14 is good, it's got sterile seeds. So you put it in somewhere and it's just there um, and it doesn't move. Um, so if you've got flowers that have got seed in, I definitely soak them in the water before putting them in your compost bin. So you don't end up with it all over the garden. OK, <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Right, so this this is my excitement at the moment, all these pretty flowers. I'm just um, excited by this. So I think it's really great every year if you can think of one new thing that you do. Um, I mean, I've kind of got two this year because I'm, I'm trying to be good with my summer mulches and that's been a bit of a disaster, but I'm gonna, um, <laughs> I'm gonna try also with green manures, but I haven't got any room at the moment. Um, I'm actually thinking about digging out a flower bed with um, lavender and roses and geraniums in and just putting green manure in it. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I will let you know how I get on. Um, like I said, the only one that I've done before really is for Celia. Um, it's really easy. It germinates quite late. You can put it in after your potatoes are out um, and it dies down completely over the winter. And if it doesn't die down, bottom right down here is the lovely flowers it has, which the bees love. So it's a, if, if you're just going to take one green manure away in your head, then put Phacelia in there. Okay. So has anybody got any fruit trees they need to do anything with or bushes? Uh, yeah, we, we have um, raspberries, apples, and gooseberries, grapes. grapes, and some either blackcurrant or something. We're not quite sure what it is, but um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a choice there. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So um, you've got apple, did you say? Hmm. Yeah, we've got a couple of apple trees. They're coxes. Brilliant. So apples you prune in the winter, so no need to worry about them until the leaves have fallen off. Um, you said uh, raspberries. Yep. So you need to try and figure out whether you've got summer or autumn raspberries. Uh, how do so, you work so um, when what do they look like? Are they um, really oh. tall or kind of mid height at the moment? So, so when, when we got it, it hadn't been they hadn't been cut back. So we cut anything that didn't have any leaves on. Um, it wasn't green. Basically, we cut back the canes. I, I believe the technical term for them is. Um, and and then we were there. Well, somewhere we, about two meters. Yeah, about one. So some of those meter, meter and a half, and then. When we were down there yesterday, um, we noticed that there's all sorts of new ones growing. Lovely. They're very, very green, green ones. It, it sounds to me if they were really tall and kind of arching and some of them were really tall and some of them were medium tall. It sounds like you had summer raspberries. Okay. Um, the difference is you've got summer and autumn ones. Autumn ones, I tell you what, if you've cut them all back, you'll know what you've got by autumn. Because if you don't get any fruit this year, you had summer raspberries. Um, <laughs> if you get fruit, you had autumn. Because autumn raspberries, you cut right down to the ground when they finish fruiting. Um, and they grow up and they fruit on one year growth. Summer raspberries, they grow kind of long, thin canes. Um, you're supposed to actually kind of bend them over and put them on a frame. Otherwise, they just go with it past where you can pick them. Um, and you cut out the fruiting bits after they've fruited and you leave the new stuff that's coming through and tie that in so you'll always have kind of like two growing so you have the new shoots in the spring and you'll have the old ones that you're waiting for the fruit on so it's like a two-year rotation with those ones 
Um, you can get, oh, if you haven't had autumn raspberries or summer raspberries pruned at all, then they'll just fruit at a slightly different time of year. Um, but I think if you've pruned them, then you'll, you'll know by the time um, the end of the year comes what you had. Um, black currants, um, you can prune them by cutting out the old wood and leaving the fresh stuff, a bit like the summer raspberries. Um, and you can, if, if they're looking really congested, like they need a prune, you can actually, when it comes to the fruit being ripe, is you can actually cut the branch off with the ripe fruit on and then sit down and pick it off um, and discard that branch. And then the new ones will produce the fruit the next year. You are supposed to prune them after they fruit. But if you think that the plant actually looks really healthy and it doesn't need any cutting, you don't have to prune things every year. Um, so what else did you say you had? Gooseberries. Yep. So um, gooseberries, the only problem with a gooseberry being over congested is you've got this gooseberry sawfly and they like it when there's loads of leaves and loads of cover for them. So if you can aim for a goblet shape with a gooseberry bush, so that it isn't too congested in the middle and maybe a bird could come in and eat any of the larvae from the sawfly, then you're not likely to get that problem. Um, so that's the aim for gooseberries. But again, I think I'd wait until after they fruit. They've probably got little tiny fruit on at the moment, haven't they? Um, yeah, they, they've got very, very small. Mm. Um, but, but again, you know, this is all stuff we've inherited. So it's, it's kind of, you know, the blind leading the blind right now. I'd just leave it for a bit and see, see watch them, see what, they, uh, what they're like. Um, and um, if you're looking for a reference book for pr fruit pruning, I really like, um, uh, I think it's RHS... Um, I'm going to have to get it because I can't remember what the name of it is. Do you mind? <laughs> Encyclopedia of Gardening. There's various um, different um, versions of RHS books. Um, you tend to find them in charity shops. Um, so just have a look in a charity shop. They're very expensive otherwise, but it's the um, Encyclopedia of Gardening one um, that is the one with the good fruit pruning guide. And they've just got really good pictures. And it's quite nice having a book as a reference. Um, I find uh, that's actually the main reason I use that book over anything else. Um, it's a pretty good um, general reference book as well. Um, uh, is there any other fruit? Uh, mm. Grapes. Grapes, yeah. Yeah, what were you saying, Anita? Uh, sorry, Emily has a, a question. Do you have any tips on growing blueberries from seed? Oh, um, I haven't grown any blueberries from seed. I bought plants. Um, didn't even cross my mind um, to do it. I can't imagine that you can't because I don't think they're on a rootstock. I think blueberries are just blueberry plants. So you can give it a go. Um, they're not too expensive to buy. They're about six quid or something um, for a bare-rooted plant um, in the winter. Main thing with blueberries is put them in ericaceous compost if you're not on acidic soil. Um, and they like um, a lot of damp. And, they, and you also need two plants for decent fruiting. Um, but yeah, we've got lovely blueberries down our allotment because it gets really wet at the bottom. Um, and even though it's not acidic soil and we have put loads of ericaceous compost in, the dampness like it's, it's almost on the water table and blueberries can get five foot by five foot they can be really huge plants and we've got about six bushes I think and we get have a, a plenty of blueberries it's lovely favorite fruit um, so grapes I'm afraid I don't know a lot about um, I know that when you see grapevines in um, different countries they have one stem don't they and they leave it but um, I think Monty did a good um, section on pruning grapes once on garden as well. So you might be able to look it up on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I'm not an expert on grapes, I'm afraid. Um, right. So any more questions about fruit? Is there anything else that I've missed out that you want to know about? Um, that was one thing. The main thing I was going to say, actually, was this time of year, the main fruit that you want to be looking at tree wise are your stone fruits. So plums, 
apricots, cherries, um, all of those fruits like to be pruned in the summer. Um, and generally I just do like formative pruning, like um, uh, I haven't done a lot of old trees. Um, all the trees that we're looking after at the moment are young. Um, but if you just go round and do what's obvious, so these three pictures are all obvious, aren't they? Look, broken branch, chop that off. Um, these two are crossing, so choose your favourite and take the one of them off. Cut it right back to this node. At the beginning. I know I've got my secretaries upside down. I was trying to take a photo on my own. It was a bit confusing. Um, and, um, you know, broken branches like this. And if you're either cut down to the node at the base and that produce, um, prevents um, too much bacteria getting in, or if you're doing, um, doing it for shape, try and choose an up and out facing bud and cut just but just above it because the little nodes and the buds and things have these antibacterial properties in so if you have a great big bit of branch before a bud if bacteria gets in the top it's got all of that time to get strong before it gets to the antibacterial thing if you cut it near the thing with the antibacterial stuff in it's le much less likely to take hold so yeah right so continuation, this is what um, we want to talk about, isn't it really? Um, so things you can sow now with good success. Um, now my slides are a mixture of pictures from my own allotment and pictures off the internet. And this is a picture off the internet and that is because I don't grow Swedes. Um, <laughs> I tried them once, they're all different shapes and sizes and I discovered that I don't really eat, I, I don't think I've bought a Swede for years. So I thought, why am I, why bother growing something you don't eat? Um, but Swedes are one root veg that you should plant, well, ideally mid-May, mid but being as our season's all completely skewy, then now. <laughs> so this, this would be a good thing to plant um, for your plot this year. Um, they get eaten by all of the normal cabbage munching predators so um putting it under horticultural fleece is a good idea um and maybe if you're doing a couple of rows or or three rows even then you could do a slightly longer piece of horticultural fleece and do hoops um along it um and then it'll all get covered up but yeah that that'll be a good one to grow Does anybody, has anyone else got any experience of growing Swede that can basically give some advice better than I can? <laughs> no. I think I just, they were fine when I grew them. I just had like one that was like as big as a football and then other ones that were like tiny. I just couldn't, couldn't seem to get them the right size. Maybe I didn't thin them out evenly enough or something. Okay. So something I do grow <laughs> is celery. Um, normal celery needs quite a long growing season, so that might be a bit late to sow it now. This is normal celery, but it's just a picture that I took yesterday, and it'll look just the same as Chinese celery. Um, the difference with Chinese and um, normal celery is that um, it grows faster. You can grow it from now, and it's stronger. So if you like it in your stews and soups and things, it's ideal. It works really well with lettuce. If you've got a small plot, I would always go for Chinese celery over normal celery just because you don't need as much of it um, to get the same flavour in stews. Um, it's a self-blanching type, um, so you don't need to do anything fancy with it other than um, plant it in the ground. You could try sowing seed in, directly in the ground or you could raise them in little modules and then plant them out. Um, but yeah, you should get a crop this year from sowing now. Um, in fact, you could even wait until after the summer solstice for some things. So pak choy and Chinese cabbage, definitely wait until after the summer solstice for these, which is 21st of June, um, because they'll go to seed if you sow them earlier than that. So you either have to get them in really early, and mine didn't do very well this year because of the cold April. So they went from cold April and then kind of, it was too late and they went to seed. So I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't work as well. Um, and um, so I'll try again, but sow the seed definitely after summer solstice because the light levels are going down. So they don't think, oh, brilliant, right, I need to make some babies. They, um, they feel like it's the end of the year and maybe if they can just hunker down, they'll last until next year. So you, um, 
bak choy and Chinese cabbage are good for that. Slugs absolutely love them though, just to warn you. Absolutely love them. Chinese cabbage especially, it's like the most delicious mixture of cabbage and lettuce for a slug. <laughs> um, any questions on those Chinese vegetables at all? Anyone grown pak choy? They're really nice. I must say they're nicer, I think, than chard. They taste a bit cabbagey, but you've got this crunchy stem that is really nice in stir fries. And then something that's a bit like a cross between spinach and cabbage. Um, so they are nice. Um, winter brassicas. So um, I think Brian was asking earlier if he's got the um, purple sprouting plants. Absolutely fine to still have small plants now. Um, I think I've found that if you plant them after the beginning of July, if you sow them after the beginning of July, you probably won't get big plants. Same goes for Savoy cabbages um, and January King. Um, they do need sowing pretty sharpish, or at least in the next month, um, and they'll be fine. But they won't. You won't be eating them until February, March, April next year. Um, I quite, I quite like this picture on the right because it just shows that veg wants to grow no matter how you treat it. So I got my first time ever, I've got my normal broccoli and my purple sprouting broccoli seeds mixed up. Don't know how I did it. Um, and so I planted these um, purple sprouting too early, um, too close together in the wrong place. I really didn't think they were purple sprouting, I thought they were broccoli, which um, grow quickly. They're really small plants, you can move them on. I did another patch with broccoli, which I thought was, you know, the other way around. Um, and that would have been nicely staked and everything. And so basically these poor things just, just collapsed and grew into these long things. And look how much purple sprouting is on there. And they just, I got loads, harvested loads. It didn't matter that they were um, mistreated. So. Purple sprouting, a really good one as well, if you get attacked by pigeons and caterpillars in the summer, because they, if, if you end up by September with a manky looking plant, you don't think it's going to anything happen to, give it a chance, leave it in the ground, and quite possibly by March, then you'll have some crop off it, because the butterflies and um, things aren't as active in the winter. Um, you might want to put a bit of netting or fleece on to protect against the pigeons. If the pigeons are hungry in the winter, then they'll have it. Um, but yeah, purple sprouting is a pretty durable plant, I must say. <laughs> um, right, is that okay for winter brassicas? Yeah, what we do for time? Half seven. Okay, carrots. So I started growing carrots in pots um, and it's seems to be much better for me than in the ground. And I put them on top of my water butt, which has got to be three, four, three foot off the ground. Um, and um, I scatter sow them, so I thin them out as they um, get going. The picture on the right was basically last year's carrot pot, where I had a few little diddlers that are left in and I'd harvested around them and they were the ones that were struggling. I probably sowed them too thick and I just put them in the polytunnel and then I think this must have been January, February, just picked all of those and they'd just grown magically over the winter um, with no effort really. But um, carrots, you can sow in the polytunnel. August is great, September's fine. Um, and they have the advantage of not having carrot mite in the winter because they're more of a summer, summer creature. So yeah, carrots are the sort of thing you can succession sow all the way through the summer. So if you've not done any yet, then I mean, you can do them up to September, um, wherever you want. Um, but if they are in the ground, they'll need some fleece or something over them um, in the summer. All right. These are Nantes variety. They tend to be long, thin, fast growing carrots. Um, but Autumn King are pretty good as well. Um, there's all sorts of different carrots. They're quite fun using the different colours. Anyone had any successes or failures or problems with carrots or that you want to share? No? Cool, I'll move on then. Right, so fennel um, is another thing that you should sow after the summer solstice. 
Um, so um, I would say try and get it in by mid-July at the latest. Um, make sure it's in a sunny patch. Um, they don't like shade at all, but um, you can plant it when you've taken something else out, like potatoes. Um, so if you haven't got any room for it now, um, if you buy some seed, then it can be ready for when you take something else out. They grow really quickly. I'm amazed at the fast uh, speed of these, these things. Um, but they do need a fair amount of space. So have them a foot apart, nine inches apart um, in the rows. You can sow them direct. Um, don't need to plant out plants. Hmm. Okay, so um, I actually just found these photos on my photo roll. This, these um, leaks are what I took a picture of yesterday. I wasn't gonna put them in the talk. But I just wanted to say they're a bit behind at the moment. These, these are very small in comparison to a normal June. Um, I've got a poppy here that I haven't weeded out because I like poppies. Um, these, um, I had the date, I think they were eating, I was eating them in April. So these are last year's leeks. And then these are the little babies. And these were sown in like February and they're just not growing fast. But you need to wait until they're a decent size to be putting in a hole um, because the white bit that you have on a leak, this, this white bit is the bit below ground. Um, so if you, if you buy any and they're in a pot, sometimes garden centers or um, like hardware stores will sell some leeks in a pot that look like a little hair grass thing, then you can just plant that in the ground and wait them, for them to grow a bit thicker before you put them in, um, in a hole. Um, but yeah, mine are nowhere near ready planting yet, which is a bit unusual. Anyone else had any problems with Anita? What were you going to say? Um, Helen, sorry, can I just ask you about fennel? Yes. Uh, I've got loads of fennel in the garden, which I use the leaves of. But is it a completely different mm -hmm. fennel that you use the bulb of? Are they two different? No, parts? it's, um, well, I mean... Fennel, Florence fennel, you use the bulb for, but you can also use the leaves. And I didn't grow fennel for ages because um, um, dill and fennel will cross pollinate. And I grow dill and I didn't want dinnel or is it Phil? Um, <laughs> the um, cross pollinated one because one of my neighbouring allotments did. And they were just loads of fronds, not really a bulb. You know, there's a cross, a halfway. So I like, I like dill, so I wanted to keep my dill as dill. Um, and it suddenly occurred to me as, well, you don't have to let your Florence fennel seed, do you? I mean, the idea is that you eat it as a bulb before it goes to seed. And right. this whole trick of planting it after July then gets around that. So I've started growing it now. But it would be interesting, um, Anita, whether you've got um, just long-term dill that's maybe just... Is it so you've never taken up the the root and it is the, the same plant or is it self seeding? Ooh, um, I it think might be perennial. I don't know whether it is perennial or not. It, it just comes back and back. I mean, I've yeah. never done anything to it. It just keeps popping back. Yeah. I wonder whether it's actually a perennial plant. Yeah. Well, here we go. Flor well, Florence fennel. Um, well, it might just be dill. Maybe it's just dill. <laughs> well, dill's quite delicate. It's um, got like yellow flowers and it's quite sort of airy fairy, whereas um, fennel's a lot more kind of bushier and, and vigorous. So it's probably, you might have the cross yeah. because there was a guy um, on our allotment that said that there's this crazy fennel thing that grows and it was cross pollinated between dill and fennel. Yeah, probably so, yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's all does gives the same flavoring for food though. And um, their uh, umbrella cuff flowers are great as uh, attracting beneficial insects that eat um, aphids and things. So um, it's either either, it's all good. <laughs> okay, right. So we've got a little bit of time now to talk about what we're harvesting now and what to do with it. Um, I noticed today my uh, potatoes have just started flowering. Um, you must wait until they're at least flowering before looking for any potatoes, but I tend to wait until they look a bit bigger and a bit tattier um, before I start rooting around. Um, but I did 
Um, the one on the left, I've tried doing, um, cause I've been doing No Dig for years and I wrote, read Charles Dowding's book, who's like the king of No Dig. And then I joined a Facebook page like literally last year and I realized that I wasn't, um, what you, I wasn't virtuous enough. I wasn't, I wasn't being like um, purist enough as it were. Um, and what I've always done is something Charles Darwin, uh, Dowding said um, is you can use a draw hoe to earth up because you're basically just moving mulch around. So that's what I've always done. But you can put mulch on and not dig at all. So I tried it with some, it's about three year rotted bark chip um, on this bed. It's, to be honest, the potatoes don't look massively healthy, but you never know what's going to be underneath um, with the yield of the potatoes. So I'm going to have a look, see. Uh, I've done a sort of a couple of beds. These are actually a different variety on the right, but on the, the far right as well, again, um, I've got the same variety as on the no dig one. So I'm going to have a look, see what the uh, difference in yield is from pure no dig to the kind of half no dig that I've obviously been doing um, before. Um, right. So yeah, ideally you want your potatoes to be flowering like this um, before you start looking for any um, and if you start seeing any black stuff on the leaves and it starts looking like they're dissolving, then take the tops off really quickly um, because that's a sign of blight. It's a very fast moving disease. Um, and if you cut them off at the stem where it comes out of the ground, then it won't affect the tubers. If you leave it and don't do anything to it, you might end up with blight in your tubers. But on the same hand, don't get overly scared if your potatoes start looking a bit rubbish and tatty and yellow and kind of dying because that's just what they do. Um, so don't worry if they, they start looking a bit tatty. Um, it's good to let some of that goodness go down into the tubers because it will just swell them a little bit more. So if it's, if it's not changed over the course of like one or two days, it's probably not blight. Um, it's pretty noticeable, to be honest. Um, so last year I tried completely not digging my potatoes to get them out and literally just rooting around with my hands. And in the polytunnel here, you can see I've laid out, this is just one bit of a row. Um, that is the stuff that I got out with my hands with not that much effort, to be honest. And I then went and dug over properly just to see what I had left. And I just had those left. So I was actually quite impressed. Um, and I did watch something recently about leaving potatoes in the same patch every year and just letting these ones that you miss come back. I'm not completely convinced by that, but it's quite interesting, which just goes to show you can grow, break all the rules, can't you? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so is anybody growing potatoes? Yeah, they're the best thing, I think, aren't they? Fresh potatoes. They taste much different, I think, to anything else. Anybody got any questions on potatoes at all? Any recipes that you want to share? No? Helen, I have a question, sorry, about potatoes. I always <laughs> have um, manky little potatoes that I forget about in the bottom of my veg box under my cupboard in the kitchen and they're sprouting massively. Is it, I, I feel really bad about throwing them away. Is it, is it a stupid idea to just bung them in the ground now? Um, I mean, I think it is a little bit late now, just because they're more likely to get blight if they're in full leaf in August, um, because that's when the spores are more likely and you tend to get quite a wet August. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's never worth, a, you know, a problem trying, is it? Um, I mean, the reason why you buy seed potatoes is apparently that they're virus free. But I know so many people that just grow potatoes from shop bought potatoes that, you know, it's not really, it's a minimal risk, I think, to just grow a shop bought potato. Um, somebody asked the same question actually on Facebook, and I think um, it is officially a bit late, but why not, you know? <laughs> Um, I have actually done the thing where I bought potatoes in August, September, I think it was August, and planted them for a crop that was supposed to give me food in December. And I thought that sounded like a really good idea. But then 
I had to spray them, like use this Bordeaux powder to try and prevent blight. It's apparently it's organic because it's sulfur out of a volcano. So it's because it's inorganic. It's not a chemical, but it just felt really wrong. I just I didn't feel comfortable with it at all. And then I was out in like late November, December in rain and cold and wind and sludge and ice and stuff digging potatoes. And I just thought, this is why you grow potatoes at the normal time of year. <laughs> so I don't have to be sliding around in the mud. So yeah, I must say I wasn't all that impressed. I think maybe um, those sorts of potatoes are good in a polytunnel or a greenhouse because then the leaves aren't getting wet so you don't have to worry about blight and you don't have to slide around in the cold trying to harvest them. So um, it seems to be quite a new thing that garden centres are starting to sell seed potatoes in August. But that, again, it says that there's rules to be broken and you could feasibly plant them at any time of year then really yeah right okay so these are my peas and these are this year's photos i love the ones with the one on the left with all the um nitrogen nodules on the roots because peas and legumes help trap nitrogen in the soil um these are little uh monge twos have a first pit yesterday um but yeah, peas are the sort of thing you can sow successively all through the year. They don't, they do take, um, say, maybe three months um, as a full cycle. So I wouldn't bother planting them after about July, late July for this year. But um, I've tried overwintering peas before and they're like mealy and horrible and they're not sweet at all. And I wouldn't bother with those really. But um, uh Definitely a late sowing of peas is a good idea. Uh, onions, I've actually seen the internet pictures. <laughs> I stopped growing onions a couple of years ago because I've got such bad white rot problem in my soil. Um, but I actually heard that you can tra um, transmit white rot through onion sets. It's a bit of sad, isn't it? Um, so I think if I did start growing them again, I'd grow them by seed because I do find that my leeks aren't that bad for white rot and they're grown by a seed. So I wonder whether all this time I've got had white rot from my onion sets. Anybody else growing onions? Yeah, are they okay so far? You said you, did you, was it you said your dog ate, like dug them up? No, they're all right. Yeah, no. no, no, ours are okay. Yeah, we seem to do quite well with onions each year. I mean, obviously we're moving them around to different locations, yeah. but um, they seem to do really quite well. I mean, to be fair, we've we've just finished our the last of our red onions from last from last year. Yeah. Nice. So we've pretty much done most of the year with our own onions. Mm. Lovely. Yeah, I think it's uh, um, something to do with the site and the soil. And yeah. the onions. Mm. They either like you or they don't. Yeah. I mean, I I did grow them for years, and it was only I'd only lose about sort of 20, 30 percent. But then it got sort of more than that. And I just thought, I think I'm just breeding more white rot. You know? mm -hmm. Give it a rest. So I think you're supposed to rest it for seven years or something and then yeah. it dry again. Mm. Um, on the veg talk notes that I've put on the um, website, there's quite a lot of recipes for different veg. So these lovely summer crops that we're getting now, like our onions should be ready around July. Um, then... Um, there's lots of uh, recipes on there. And if anybody wants to share any recipes, then I'll um, update the notes and put it on there for everybody else to see as well. So it's nice to share these things, isn't it? Um, and how you like growing things. So these are this year's tomatoes. They're not massive, but they're not tiny. I need to remove the lower leaves and put some canes up because um, I haven't done that yet. Um, anybody else got their tomatoes in? Not yet. Hopefully tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be putting them in. <laughs> Everything's a bit slow, isn't it, this year? A bit late. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, I've only got t three decent-sized aubergines. The rest are tiny, and my peppers are tiny. Not ready to go in at all. Um, okay, so this is last year's tomatoes. Um, so anybody got a problem with the side shoot? What is the pinching out the side shoot thing? Because tomatoes can get into a bushy, tangly mess if you're not careful, really. Um, you've got two different sorts of tomatoes. So you've got bush tomatoes that people tend to put in hanging baskets. 
um, and they don't need any pruning or looking after at all, but they do tend to sprawl in a mass. And cordon tomatoes, generally you're trying to train them up as one stem. So this is the bit that you need to uh, cut off, um, off the bit between the leaf, which is here, and the stem, you'll get another little bit coming out at 45 degrees. So if you pinch those off, then it keeps it nice and upright. And the reason why you want to um, keep your tomatoes pruned is so that it gives good airflow. So tomatoes like good airflow, they don't like their leaves being wet. Um, and those two things together will cause blight. Um, so as long as you keep good airflow, you should be fine for blight. And especially if you're in a, a polytunnel or a greenhouse, just keep both doors open, one door open, whatever you've got, um, as long as there isn't a frost and get the, keep the airflow going. Yeah. yeah, that's blight. Basically, as soon as you start seeing this, I'd say um, harvest all of them um, because they're not going to get any better. They're not... Um, it's only going to be downhill once you see one with this on um then they'll be it'll be pretty quick and they go so you can take the opportunity to make loads of um, green tomato chutney um this was actually just when we were clearing out the poly polytunnel quite late on last year um you can cook green tomatoes like a vegetable and they hold their shape better seeing the right hand picture you can still see the shape of the green tomatoes whereas the red ones have just or the orange ones have just disintegrated um so yeah um don't be afraid to put them in curries um as long as they're cooked you don't have to just eat them in green tomato chutney okay that's a really simple recipe um just frying everything up together and put it it's got the ingredients on the left um so spinach so on the left you've got last year's beautiful leaves healthy plants. This is one of the pickings of a massive pile in my sink, cutting out the little stem to freeze. This is this year's. I did exactly the same thing and they just haven't worked. So you can see these little tiny plants that got planted out, I don't know, maybe a month ago, are just already going to seed. So yeah, very, very disappointing spinach this year, but I think it's just the weather. I can't oh. see I've done anything different. We, we, we've never been able to grow spinach successfully in the last um, couple of seasons. It's literally bolted. You, you think it looks great one day and the next day you've gone up and it's bolted and you can't use it. I think it might be another thing that's good to sow after the summer solstice. Mm -hmm. So I either sow it early, early, like February, which I did, but then I think April just messed everything up and then May just, it didn't get a chance really. Um, and um, so I think I'll maybe have another go after the, um, after the summer solstice and see if that will stop it bolting, because in theory it should, shouldn't it? Because um, it's when the lights, nights are getting longer and it's too dry that things bolt. Um, same with coriander as well, you always have your coriander bolts. Um, if it's kept in the shade a little bit more as well, it helps. Um, any questions on that? No way. What we do? Oh, ten minutes. Right. So, uh, sweet corn. I think. Um, I think the way to gauge whether a sweet corn's ready is actually kind of by the weight of it. If you can kind of, um, the black end should go black, um, and they should feel like plump and heavy. Um, you can peel back some of the outer and actually see whether the corns are, are yellow. Um, but yeah, it's quite hard to tell when a sweet corn is ripe. But um, they work really well in a garden because they look a bit like an ornamental grass. You see them there with those grasses. They just look really like they fit, don't they? Um, so I might shove some in my garden again. Really good as a sort of potager thing. Um, anybody doing sweet corn this year? Yeah, I think water it if it gets really dry in the middle of the summer because they can kind of um, go to seed early when they're only like, young plants and then you don't get as good harvest so if it's a really dry spell and you can see that they're starting to maybe one of them started to get a bit of um the frond of going to seed then maybe give them a bit of water and it'll make them a bit better uh beans so we talked about beans earlier didn't we about um runners being a little bit more hardy than french 
Um, they like generally like compost. If they keep looking yellow, it might be good to give them a bit more compost, maybe even a bit of lime. Um, so it could be the soils too acidic. Make a bit of lime. Um, now, last year, um, this is the bean structure. I was actually hoping to get it up this year so I could show you proper pictures um, from the right way, but that's the only picture I can actually find. Um, but we do a, like a bean tunnel because um, the only thing with a bean structure is that so many people fall down in heavy in high winds. So if you've got high winds and then you've got really heavy beans on something that hasn't got an A-frame or isn't tethered to something, it will quite often fall over. And we actually have started doing a tunnel over, over one of the paths, so on the edge of two beds. And we put the canes, so we have two that way, one over the top. And then we brace it. You can see the bracing one's easy because it's from the side. We brace it like that from the sides. And we also cross over braces on the top and tie it with string. And we haven't had it fall down since. And it is, um, we've got quicker and quicker at doing it. So we can do that in about an hour and a half, maybe an hour now um, and do 10 each side. Um, so yeah, just thought I'd show you that as a something that we found works. Anybody growing beans? Most people. Beans are pretty mainstay, aren't they? Um, I, I, um, I tried freezing beans one year and it ruins the flavour. Has anybody else tried that? Yeah, I definitely recommend drying them. You can either let them dry on the pod like these have or you can take them out a bit fresher and actually leave them on a piece of blotting paper on the side. So pumpkins will last um, in a cool, dry place for ages stored. Um, I like baby bears, which are like small pumpkins like this. These are what I grew last year and I wasn't really all that keen. Um, they always seem to get mildew. This is mildew. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it does it if you haven't watered them enough. But you'll still get pumpkin. Um, they're pretty easy plants actually. My plants are still quite little so if you haven't started yet then pumpkins are still something that you could do. You can maybe buy a plant from the shops um, if you haven't grown it from seed. Any questions going on? Um, these are the courgettes. Uh, that was the day I planted them out, actually. Um, and one of my favourite meals with pretty much everything that you eat in the summer, like tomatoes and beans and courgettes and peppers um, and onion and pot new potatoes with olives and feta. It's just the best meal. And you just make French, dress French vinaigrette with it and have it hot. Very much recommend that. Anyone got any favourite recipes they want to share? Summer produce. Do you think of anything if I put you on the spot? <laughs> oh, well, if it comes to you, then do say. <laughs> I love courgettes. I do grow a lot of them. Um, I grow like seven plants or six or seven plants um, in the thought that one probably will die at some point. There always seems to be one. Um, but they are big plants. You see, this is in my garden, how big the leaves are actually. Um, and it's taking up about a meter. Um, so really, if you're not an absolute courgette fan like I am, then one or two plants is fine for a family. Um, so um, I just, I like picking them small when they're like no more than sort of um, six inches. Um, and uh, yeah, love them. Can't get enough courgettes, so. <laughs> Claire's recommended courgette chocolate cake, but like, I guess, uh, carrot cake, but courgettes nice. sounds, sounds good. Yeah, I've um, tried beetroot chocolate cake was pretty good, but I've not tried courgette. My mum makes a courgette and walnut loaf that almost is healthy. <laughs> Definitely the healthiest kind of cake. 
Emily's also asking about squashes. Are you going yes. to do squashes? Squashes, yeah. Squashes and courgettes are kind of the same thing. What, do, what would you like to know about them? Uh, Emily is asking that she, we tried some squashes this year and none of our seeds have come up. Any tips? Yeah. I think it's just been a really weird year. My mum had exactly the same thing. Um, I didn't plant, I didn't sow mine until mid-May. So it was a couple of weeks ago and they all came up. Um, so, I mean, you might want to just try sowing some more and it's just warmer now. So I think, think if a seed sits there for too long being too cold, it will just rot. And so many of these things like beans and um, peas and, well, not so much peas, but um, beans and squash and courgettes and cucumbers and peppers and everything, um, they need a certain amount of heat to germinate. And if they didn't get that in April and May, which it wasn't warm at all, um, then they might just have rotted. Um, so, yeah, just get either get some more seed or buy a, a couple of plants. Um, give it another go there's always uh, every year if you grow a variety of things there's always things that work really well and things that don't work well um, is there any anything else that anybody's stuck on or um is just wondering about because this is um your chance really to um hope i mean there's a few of us here as well with different experiences so maybe we can help each other if i don't know the answer I'll share, can I share a recipe? Yeah. Uh, courgette flour is used in Bengali cooking where you take the flour and you have gram flour, which is chickpeas, I think, chickpea flour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you make it into a very uh, thin batter with a few black onion seeds, a bit of salt, and you dip the flour in and you deep fry it. Nice. And it's gorgeous. They're like flower pakoras delicious i've never tried them i keep looking at the courgette flowers thinking about this recipe and not actually done it it's good it's good yeah we should actually do it you can do you can deep fry battered um elderflowers can't you like mm. sugar you can do these really amazing um and basically deep fry anything with sugar it's going to be nice <laughs> elderflower fritters you can make elderflower fritters with um with like sugar sprinkle on them and it's a similar kind of thing that they're very they're very light and all, like very melt in the mouth really nice nice well um on the, uh, where was it this picture you can see how these are the male flowers which mm -hmm. presumably you could use those for the um uh fritters whereas these are the female ones are on the end of oh well i presume that's the way around they are it might not be i presume the female has the courgette on the end but it might not be um but yeah i always find like i i think about doing it and even though i've got loads of courgettes i've only got like one or two flowers that look like they're ready to pick but i want to have this plant where it's got five at once yeah and then I'll do it. Do you do you have to like get the batter inside the flour or is it just on no, the outside? You just sort of dip it in. Okay. Um, Claire is saying lots of nice recipes to stuff the courgette flowers before frying, oh. which I've never tried. That sounds really good. And Emily is sharing Korean radish. Muli. Muli. Ah, yes. Same in Hindi, actually. Muli is Hindi for radish as well. Um, we're growing them for the first time this year to add kimchi. Does anyone have any experience growing these as I was hoping to freeze them too? Nice. I, um, I've grown um, parsnip rooted parsley before. I've had root of parsley, but I've never grown the mooly radish. I think I bought the seed once and didn't sow it or something. <laughs> so yeah, no, I haven't actually tried it. It's good in Chinese stir fries, isn't it? Mooley's just good. Yeah. Good stock. Yeah, have you had them then? Yeah, I mean, in India, when I lived in India, that was radish. I mean, you just had a big, big white, like it's, it looks just looks like a, a, a huge white carrot. Um, so the idea of these little pathetic, small, pinky things that you call radish over here, they're just like, ah, that's not a radish. 
um, Lovely. You just, you just uh, uh, chop them, peel them and chop them really fine with, and squeeze lemon and lime on them, uh, lemon and salt. And nice. So you don't cook them necessarily? No. No, okay. I wouldn't cook really. No, because um, I was reading about fodder radishes today and there's one called Dow downy or something with a D and you can use it as both fodder radish for improving your soil and you can eat it. I don't know whether it's quite as palatable as the mooly one. Yeah, I um, I'd imagine that if they've got one that's a bit more famous for eating then it's probably better. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, radish grow like really quickly, don't they? So presumably um, it's a good, easy crop. Yeah. Um, so um, cabbage, this is last year's cabbage, which is obviously working. I was actually looking at my notes and mid, mid to late May, I'm eating cauliflowers and ca cabbages for last year. And this year, uh, my, ca my cauliflowers, even the ones that weren't in the wool or the straw, the ones in the other bit, are still this big. They haven't grown at all. It's ridiculous. Um, but anyway, if you do get to the point where you've eaten some of your cabbages and not others, you can put new ones in from a seed bed as long as you put some mulch on the surface. And you can see this dark is actually a, um, a layer of compost. Um, and I love actually just raw cabbage off the chopping board. I think it's really sweet and spicy. Um, so yeah, and obviously coleslaw, but there's so many recipes for coleslaw. Um, I, got, I had a really nice one that I've been doing, which is um, mustard seed, turmeric, um, ch fresh chili, no onion, um, just carrot and cabbage, and then putting some um, sour cream on at the end. It's lovely. Um, it's in the river it's a riverford recipe so you can look it up um, on their website um but yeah there's so many different ways of doing coleslaw <laughs> so many interesting coleslaws uh so what else have we got we've got broccoli i mean broccoli is just broccoli isn't it you eat it and same as lettuce so this is my lettuce now i've got a mixed pack and i noticed some of them are hearting up so I'm actually cutting the ones round that are sort of squished in here. I'm using as um, cut and come again and just getting the outer leaves. And I was doing that with all of them to start with. But now some of these ones like Webb's Wonderful here, I'm just going to leave that to heart up. Um, yeah, love, love a bit of lettuce. Turnip, don't grow turnip, don't like them. Grew them once and ended up giving them to my friend who has pigs. So I really don't like turnips. <laughs> But they grow like radishes. They're so easy and you don't need to net them or fleece them or protect them from caterpillars or pigeons because they don't like them either. <laughs> but if you like turnips, then they are so easy to grow. Highly recommend growing them for a beginner. Um, so, yeah, my beetroot is really strange. Some of it, like I sowed all this at once. And I have half, like those two rows, and this is like two weeks later, growing like wildfire. Not too bad, actually, growth on the other ones, but how weird is that patchy row there? Did I have a slug just coming all the way from the other side and just getting that far along the row? I don't know. Oh, but yeah, beetroot are lovely. They're pretty easy. I love the way the little seedlings have these little red bits in the middle. Um, kohlrabi, again, don't really like kohlrabi. I thought these interesting... Um, these pictures were interesting off the internet where you had this one, which is showing obviously cracked dry soil, but huge kohlrabi. Who knows if that's got um, artificial fertilizers on or not. But this, this person's mulched it with straw. Bit of a smaller one, but I think the caption was something like, something like this is what it looks like so far. So I expect they're probably leaving it to grow. But um, yeah, I thought that was quite interesting seeing um, mulches on, uh, on the interweb. Um, and garlic, same reason as I'm not growing onions um, anymore because of white rot. Garlic was so disappointing. They would just come out and they'd just be falling apart with white rot. So I've given up with those. Um, but is there anybody, I think that is the end of, um, oh, apart from fruit, that's the end of the vegetables that I was going to talk about. So has anybody got any more vegetables they want to discuss or recipes or anything like that? Or are we all getting a bit tired now? It's eight o'clock. Could we just ask you about rust on onions and garlic? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's an airborne um, thing and same as mildew. I think you get rust a bit more when it's dry and mildew a bit more when it's wet. You are supposed to take the leaves off that get affected by rust. Um, I, I've found in the past it's a bit of a losing battle because if it's in the air and it's the right conditions, then another leaf will just get it. Um, I haven't found that it's been a major issue um, in previous years. There was 2012 was a really bad year for mildew when it didn't stop raining all year. That was like they all just dissolved. And I was thinking, God, if it's going to be like this every year, I'll have to build them a cover so they don't get so wet. But um, I wouldn't say rust has been a massive problem. It might help to water them if it's really dry. Um, I think, um, yeah, you, you can, um, with onions and things, I was still getting, when I did grow them, I was still getting a harvest and it was really the white rot out of the three things, which was the rust, the mildew and the white rot. I got all three, but it was the white rot that was the real problem. Mm -hmm. And the rust and the mildew were just kind of a bit like, mm, they might have been a bit smaller because of that. Oh, yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, I think as well, when you're on an allotment, it's difficult um, with airborne things because you might be able to control your bit, but if your neighbour hasn't controlled their bit, then it's um, it's yeah. difficult. We've noticed a bit of rust elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you get it a bit on leeks as well. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and it, sometimes it affects one plant a lot and then it doesn't affect the one next to it at all. Mm. Yeah. We, we muddled up our leeks and our seed onions this yeah. year so we don't know what we've planted where <laughs> <laughs> so you do seed onions well we've never done them before but we've tried yeah but the, the, whether the, the, the shallots these sort of banana yeah. shallots yeah um, so um they, they look I, I, I think i know what they, which ones they are now because they're looking a lot healthier than the uh <laughs> than the leeks um but yeah we they look in the pots and i, I mixed up the labels and well I think one didn't have a label and I just assumed they're all leeks because I forgot that I'd planted <laughs> shit that I mean. mm. So, so we'll easily see. done, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So we'll see how we go on with those. Yeah. But they seem they look they 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 seem in good condition. They seem to have worked. So yeah. Yeah. So. Well I think when when I was first growing onions, I did get some seed. Um and I grew silver skin. Um, easily um, but they're a bit fiddly because they're so small mm. um, and um, I learned that apparently when you get an onion set that's a one year old onion mm. um, and so you grow it from seed to get to onion set size by the autumn and mm. then next year it gets bigger but yeah. having said that my stepdad used to grow the competition style onions um and he would grow a big onion in one year from seed so i think it depends on the variety you get yeah. um because i think it's ginsters pasties grow these huge onions like because they just want them industrial for sort of chopping up into pasties exactly. so they're not for sale but they're they're huge onions and um i think it might have been a seed a bit like that that they were growing in this competition he had a competition with a farmer friend of his who could grow the biggest onion and I think the farmer guy had a Ginsters pasty onion variety. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I think they are probably something that could be grown in one year. You mm. get the right seed. And I don't know about shallots. Presumably they might be a one year thing as well. But you put one shallot in, don't you? And then you get loads. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, when we, yes, we, we, we bought shallot sets and yeah, they're kind of like um, octopuses coming out of the ground pretty much. Yeah. And, yeah, they're, they're, they're interesting. They're quite quite funny to. to yeah. Work so you might find that if you put grow one shallot from seed this year, then if you plant that, then you'll get a bunch of shallots next year, perhaps. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Well, although these are banana shallots, so they they kind of just like one, oh. one on their own that we're that we're growing. So we'll see how, how they come this. There's so many different types of everything, isn't there? Like um, there are perennial leeks and um, perennial onions you can get. And the, the choice is amazing when you actually start researching it. And um, yeah, and I've apparently uh, elephant garlic is actually a type of leek or something. <laughs> yeah, something like that. That's why it's so mild. Right. So it's all just sort of al allium family and, and such a lot of variety in it. 
Um, mm. Yeah, really interesting. Mm. Lovely. Right, so um, that's just on the right there, there's a picture of how I open freeze fruit. I use a lot, most of the fruit that I eat is for having with my porridge. Um, and my husband has it with his muesli. And if we can go all year with the going from frozen fruit until the first strawberries come, then I feel like I'm winning. Um, I did it the year before last. I didn't do it last year. I ran it, I think mainly because my husband was started eating them as well. So it was like, it was all right for one. But then when he started eating them, it didn't, didn't quite stretch. But I'm so looking forward to when strawberries are coming and they're late. These are, all, these are my strawberries, they're still nowhere near. Um, but yeah, cherries I tend to do um, as cherry sauce with duck. Um, but um, it's good to get a stoner, um, a proper cherry stoner if you've got cherries. These are Morellos. Um, but yeah. Right, so I think that is it. <laughs> Any questions that you can think of about fruit? We covered pruning, didn't we? But um, anything about storing or recipes that you want to share? I will stop sharing my uh, screen. Oh. Ah, lovely, I'm back. <laughs> that was a bit weird then. Lovely. So um, I hope that was all right for everyone. We're sort of trying to cover what was, thank you, <laughs> what was relevant for this time of year. Um, so yeah, if you want to catch up on planting, spacing and all the rest of it and protection, then that will be the April talk. But I'm going to do another one of these in September um, to cover some of the fruit and veg that we didn't talk about um, now that we might be harvesting by then um, and also uh, doing garlic for overwintering, um, broad beans, uh, things like that that we can um, have over the winter and I'll go back to the theory again um, as well so um, a little bit more on um, the no dig method and um, actually planning your rotation um, on your plot and things like that so um, if you'd like to join us, then you're more than welcome. Okay, lovely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, uh, thanks thank everyone. you very much. Thank That's you. That's all right. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. I hope it's been of help. It's been really helpful. Thank you.